Business Transformation. Karen has over 20 years of experience running ventures in Canada and East Asia. Both her software companies, Ace, POS Solutions, and Taco Labs were acquired by U.S. private equity in 2022, with Karen now leading the Canadian division of their B2B SaaS portfolio. She's also a mentor and an uh, EIR at various accelerators across Canada, mentoring tomorrow's startups and tech leaders. Karen, we're so lucky to have you here, and I welcome you to begin the session. Thank you so much, Alina. I'm really excited to be here. And that picture is pre-COVID. So I apologize for the way I look today. Obviously, surviving the pandemic has been hard. And so um, I don't have time to do a lot of things, including brushing hair and all of that these days. But I'm going to share a screen to make sure I get my deck up. Can you guys see it? We're good? Yep, okay. we can see Perfect. it. Okay. So thank you again for taking the time to join me tonight, because um, I think... I'm assuming everybody who is joined today is somebody who's interested in, besides being an entrepreneur and besides growing their existing businesses, you're wanting to learn and understand more about what it means to bootstrap, right? Um, and so obviously this is the session that we're talking about today. I'm just going to go over quickly some of the topics that we're going to cover. Uh, I just want to make sure that we cover certain things. Obviously, the whole idea here is to be as engaging as we can. And if people do have questions, we can obviously dive deeper into certain topics as people, you know, raise those questions in the chat or at least uh, maybe ping uh, Alina about them because Alina can actually flag me if we want to talk a little bit more about certain topics, right? Um, I'm going to give a little bit of a quick intro about myself, but I will talk more about my own businesses and what we did my, ourselves later on. Um, at a high level, I, uh, I actually am a non-technical startup founder. I uh, originally started my businesses in Canada. I had a wholesale business in Canada. I moved to Asia for eight years. Um, I worked there in manufacturing. I started a retail kind of a business over there also and a trading firm. So I've done kind of retail, manufacturing, all of those things. One of the things I hated the most was the applications that I used because they were terrible for the types of things we did. So like many startup founders, I had a problem I couldn't solve with the technology out there and I decided to build. But what I did was I came back to Canada to, to, to do that. And then I'm going to talk a little bit further about what I did and how I did that. But before I do that, I'd like to go through some of the, I guess, some, kind of an overview of what we're talking about today, right? So um, I'm not going to be spending a lot of time defining things or talking about a glossary or things like that. I don't think that's things that you guys uh, wouldn't have already received possibly in other sessions or detailed workshops. This is meant to be a more of a, an engaging, hopefully engaging experience and conversation about what it means, at least from my perspective, to be bootstrapping and from my own experience. At a high level, at least generally the definition that most people usually agree on is bootstrapping usually means it's a funding method for your business. And it's a funding method which involves you not taking institutional money of any sort. So that means no, no formal loans and no investment. It doesn't necessarily mean you don't take a loan from mom or dad or sisters and brothers, right? It just means that you haven't signed necessarily your house away. Um, and so therefore, it's a really different experience because mainly there's two sides of it. And both of them I'll touch upon. But one of them is essentially, of course, self-funding it through your own savings and assets. And the other side of it is reinvesting revenue from whatever your operations are back into the business consistently to keep growing it, right? So, I mean, why do we bootstrap? I know most of you probably know this, but I think it's it's worthwhile to at least highlight some of the things that we, the reasons why people bootstrap, why I did it. Um, I mean, my name is Karen. So I got to say, I'm a bit, I'm not necessarily someone who doesn't like to control things. And that doesn't mean that, of course, entrepreneurs are control freaks, but the reality is we all probably have a vision and there's things that we want to achieve. And we have a vision that isn't achieved through maybe whatever we're doing today in our career. A lot of that is the reason why many people choose to move forward. They find a problem, they can't solve it with the solutions of today, and they want to do that. And the greatest control you can have, of course, is through bootstrapping, because you are not accountable to outside investors, you're not accountable to outside banks, right? I think the second and third are probably my two favorite and probably the major reasons why um, I usually encourage people, especially at the early stage, to consider bootstrapping first. The first one is financial discipline. Um, 
I've actually had multiple businesses in my lifetime and my earlier businesses, because they were new businesses, I was a new entrepreneur. I wanted things to be perfect. I spent money on things that were, were not necessary. And of course those businesses failed. And so part of it is the financial discipline that comes from bootstrapping is very, very common. You hear it a lot with people. It doesn't necessarily always come naturally to people to learn how to use, use things, to barter for services, to barter for, for products and things. And so therefore having the ability to do that means if and when you raise, if and when you grow and you're ready to take that next, next stage, you're actually in a much better position and in a very, very solid, um, I guess you can say, due dil from a due diligence perspective, because you already run your business in the way in which an investor would want to see you run it, right? The customer focus is extremely important because when you're bootstrapping, usually you're getting most of your fund for your funding from your revenue and your and your early customers. And so therefore you tend to really drill down and double down, right? So with all of my startups and all of my businesses, all those early customers, I sold them in, right? I we were supporting them, I was supporting them. And so having that type of product knowledge, having that type of hands-on knowledge is extremely important as you move further in. Um, and of course, the last thing, which is pretty easy, is flexibility is is key, um, especially during things like the pandemic, where I had to pivot five, six, seven times and within the same year just to survive. Right. Having to do having the ability to do that on my own was a major advantage just because I didn't have to necessarily get another checkbox or another request or another confirmation of approval, which I mean, today I do have to do, but it was a very different story at that point, right? When when there, when there were no sources of income. So I'm not going to go into these type, this type of slide very in much depth, because I think again, a lot of this sometimes will be covered in other workshops. Some of these stages are the same when you bootstrap or if you raise or if you do other things. The only major difference is what happens within the stage. So when we say idea validation, um, it's very, very different when you're bootstrapping or if you've raised enough money or if you raise some seed or angel funding to be able to create your MVP, for example, right? Being able to do something with very minimal resources in bootstrapping makes the idea validation quite a different experience, right? For a, a somebody who's actually self-funding. Same thing with all of the early growth, sustainability and scaling, right? So your early growth stage, what that usually refers to is, you know, those early customers, how are you going to get them? I mean, it's not the same when you have funding to start running a paid ad campaign, right? Everybody wants to run paid ad campaigns on social media, but the reality is nowadays to get really any traction, you probably at least need about a thousand dollars, fifteen hundred, two thousand dollars to get some real expertise or traction. Not everybody has that kind of cash flow or money available. So where are you going to find those new customers, right? And so again, when you're planning the bootstrapping, you you don't necessarily have to have all the answers, but again, all of these are distilled down very differently when you are self-funding. And it goes on and on, of course, into the sustainability and scaling. So I'm going to probably focus quite a bit on this section because I think these are things that not necessarily are raised as much, or at least not enough when I talk to people about bootstrapping. Um, these are things that I've I've actually talked to quite a number of founders about because I have been mentoring where I can in different programs. Uh, and these are things that I actually came across myself uh, quite a lot when I was actually considering what to do. I want to reaffirm and remind everybody that bootstrapping is basically the most common way to actually finance any type of startup or business. So I know that we, and I don't want to say it in any bad way, it's not a bad thing. It's a major, it's a major win. Raising outside funding is obviously extremely, extremely difficult. And if you do, and you are able to do that, that's a great success, right? But the reality is most types of businesses are not suitable for that. And maybe not necessarily the growth path and the growth trajectory that most people even want to achieve, right? So I want to make sure of that. I always point this out because when I talk to people, everybody has the conception is I want to be Uber. Well, if that's what you want to be, that's fine, right? But being Uber is not obviously a short-term thing and it isn't 
it's really almost one in a million type of scenario who like not everybody will basically become a unicorn, right? And that's just the reality of the sheer numbers based on available investment and the number of startups that are fighting for it, right? So I'm gonna talk about these two things because I think these are not necessarily reviewed or addressed as much um, when people are thinking about what to build. For myself, when I actually started to run a business, first of all, I actually didn't even want to be an entrepreneur for most of my life. Uh, my my parents always wanted me to go into a corporate job. I always thought I would climb the corporate ladder. The only thing I found out was I got really frustrating, frustrated not being able to solve certain problems. And I believed that I could do things better. And my first couple businesses, you know, should have proved me wrong, but I was persistent, right? I felt that I could do things better. And of course, I tried to learn from every time. But there's some things that you actually can't change that you have to consider whatever you're building, right? I'm going to talk about some of the easiest ones. But again, not necessarily something you think about. If you are at an early enough stage, it might be something you can change. It may not necessarily be today. But the biggest one, which everybody is aware of right now, is, of course, the economics of everything, right? So when we say timing is everything, a good example is I'm in retail tech. We were going to launch our SaaS product in March, 2020. Our product works exclusively with brick and mortar retail stores. That is when the pandemic hit. We were about to launch a week before the lockdown. And so I could, obviously I can change that. That's nothing I can change. And that's something you have to anticipate. So part of it is, yes, the economics are sometimes so big that you they're out of your control. But I always encourage people to really think about it and consider it in their decisions if they're, let's say, in the ideation stage or thinking about markets to go into. Like you, you cannot assume politics and you cannot assume economics do not touch your business. It, they trickle down eventually, right? Those interest rates are hitting everybody today. The labor market, surprisingly, obviously, interest rates are, are causing, obviously, a lot of layoffs, which is actually making it easier to hire tech. Two years ago, we couldn't hire any developers in the tech stack we wanted. So again, all of this stuff comes into play. Um, the microeconomics comes into play because if you're going to bootstrap, you really need to be able to answer, let's say, at least these four questions. So when you're selling something and you want to be bootstrapping, the question to ask, of course, is one of them is how much capital is actually required to succeed in an effective, efficient manner in the sector and the product that you're trying to build. I think if I'm building med tech, the answer is probably not bootstrapping because to be able to do some of the things that need to be done, to be able to do certain um, industries where hardware is a million dollars a piece, that is a very different proposition, obviously, than somebody who's selling a product that can be mocked up or an MVP that, be, that can be created at home or with no code in bubble, right? So that's something I always remind people about because, again, we we I definitely encourage if we have the vision, we should go for it, but we need to know where it's appropriate. And obviously, whether the, it, bootstrapping is appropriate, this is one of the things you have to think about. Um, B2B versus B2C, again, hugely different, right? B2C usually is a huge amount of marketing spend. B2B is usually a very, very different sales cycle to sell in, right? You need usually quite a lot of if you're going to build a sales team, for example, those the product life cycles are longer. All of those types of things change the way in which you plan out all your cash flow. So something else to think about, right? Um, I talk about sustainable competitive differentiator. I know that's kind of just a lot of words, but it's so important to really honestly think about where you are in the ecosystem that you play. I mean, we had a lot of problems trying to get to actually raise in certain investment environments because we had major players and we were in a basically a mature market. We actually competed in what was considered a very, very mature category, right? And so for a lot of people, when we were trying to raise, it's like, well, how are you different from this? That was basically the question in almost every pitch I, we had to do. Well, how are you different from this person? How are you different from the other key player? And so again, is this something that you have thought about? Because it will you know, determine part of your decisions on whether or not you want to bootstrap or 
possibly use institutional funding. I think these are, again, a couple other things that are really, really important if you are bootstrapping. So time versus the market. Um, how many years are you actually willing to invest in this? And I'm going to say years because I talk about it later on in terms of number years. And I'm going to talk about it in my own experience. Everybody talks about wanting to get in and get out or exit in five to seven years. That's always the ideal outcome, right? Or a possible outcome. But we're still talking years. And when we say years, you have to think about this. So when you're planning out a bootstrapped, let's say bootstrapping strategy, you need to think about, okay, if I need to have a run rate of this much to try to achieve this, how long will it take me to build my product? How long will it take me to actually build up enough interest to actually start selling enough that I can cover my costs? And in the meantime, you also have to learn how to run a business. Unless you've, of course, done it before, which is why, you know, my third, fourth businesses were way more successful because I failed in the first couple, right? And I think this is probably the, the hardest part of it. When I say the true opportunity cost of your sacrifice, if you are bootstrapping, you are not using other people's money. You are using all of your money. You are using all of your assets. When I say all of your assets, that includes your, san your, your sanity, your salary, if you still have some, your time and of course, your family. Um, I cannot tell you how many startups I've seen. I have so many co-founder friends and 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 those in in the tech space. A lot of the times, the actual fail point is that they could not sacrifice and could not afford that opportunity cost anymore. Whether it be their marriage, whether it be their kids, whether it be their mortgage. That actual, the true opportunity cost of that sacrifice has to be very, very, very clear because it's a complete trade-off, right? In bootstrapping, you do not have somebody with a checkbook. So money and time are basically almost opposing to some extent. You spend money on things and the things you don't spend money on will take you more time. And that will make your startup take longer to achieve what you're trying to do. And so therefore, have you done that math to see, okay, for me to achieve what I think I need to do, I probably need to sacrifice this much time at least. And then really in reality, that's probably double. And can you afford that? Is your family, do you have that support system in place? Is partners and all of those things, right? Um, in almost every business I've had, I've been very lucky to have my family support. And in almost every business I've had, my biggest problem has have been my co-founders and partners. And so those types of questions sometimes don't come up because it, there's a lot of EQ and emotional stuff involved in that calculation, but you need to think about that carefully, right? Uh, it's, is it worth it to build a business and lose your, lose your partner and your spouse, right? So, I mean, these types of things are things you have to really assess. Um, and then what is your ideal outcome? I asked this, even though I didn't even know that going in. And the reason why I say I didn't know that is I actually, when I first built my my current, the businesses that I sold recently, I had just returned from Asia. So I returned in 2015. And um, I'll talk about how I started the businesses. But long story short, I basically picked up an existing business. And when I did that, I ran the business the way I was running my previous businesses. But I knew nothing about accelerators. I knew nothing about the concept of using other people's money and in institutional funding. Like, I, I mean, I was paying rent. I was doing everything that you would normally do without knowing that I could get things like hot seats and all these other things, right? But the one question people kept asking me every time they met up with me at an accelerator, so what, what's your exit plan or exit strategy? And I, and I just couldn't understand this because for me, it was like, I'm trying to build something right now. I can't even think about, I don't even know where this is gonna end. And I wanna build something that's gonna last. But if I really sit down now and think about it, I probably wasn't necessarily wanting to build something that would, I would work on for 20 years. I mean, given my age, given my husband's age, and given what we wanted to achieve in life, right? I mean, we happen to not have children, but we like to travel. And so certain things come into consideration. We work as digital nomads a lot now today. But again, that's something, that's our choice. And for other people, it might be something different. And so therefore, you, I would really cons uh, emphasize this, and I talk this a little bit later on when I talk about costing, about the ideal outcome, because the way in which you structure the business changes the way in which you actually should um, plan the, the, like the exit strategy.
because uh, there's different tax implications. And I didn't even know that until, of course, we exited, right? So I can tell tell you guys a little bit more about that as we move further on. Um, the last one is kind of something I've already talked about a little bit earlier, which is the time trade-off with money. So because bootstrapping, everything is like half the pace, half the speed, are you going to be able to actually build the, the product that you're trying to build in the market that you're trying to build in time? For example, if you're building something in AI today, I'm not necessarily sure that bootstrapping will work unless you're in a very possibly niche market or you have a special differentiator. Because right now that market is so frothy and moving so fast, then it might be very, very difficult to actually bootstrap to that stage, to that point, right? Again, there's others who are obviously experts in the, in, in what would be right for different tech sectors. But I think it's important to keep in mind that if you're building something for a specific market, you better hope the market's still there by the time you're done. Because that was one of the things that obviously killed quite a lot of businesses, especially during the pandemic, right? Some people couldn't last the two, three years during lockdowns. So the resources I'm going to talk about here, I'm not necessarily going into a lot of detail here. There is obviously some information here for you, but I wanted to talk about it because I think these are just things that people need to think about. When I say your resources, I mean, you have to do an honest self-assessment of all of these things yourself. So what that means is, how much time are you actually willing to commit? Because if you say 40, 80, I can tell you even today after post-acquisition, I'm still working like 120 easily a week, right? Hours a week. And so all of those things are are, are the things that make sense for you? Because bootstrapping basically, again, drags out that whole entire life cycle of the business. And then this honest self-assessment of skills and assets is something that so many people don't do. Uh, and especially if you have a partner, because everybody, obviously it's good to believe in what you're doing. And obviously you will not know everything and you will want to learn everything, but you really need to sit down and say, okay, I really am not very good at this. I'm good at this. How can I plug these holes? And this is just for yourself. So you have to be honest with yourself about what you need to do. I'm going to emphasize something here because it's been a problem in basically every business I've had, which is if you have a partner and a co-founder or, or somebody that you're, you're, you're working together with on this, on this bootstrapped um, idea, I think you should really assess if you guys are in the same financial positions or similar positions. This is a massive problem for many, many people. It actually basically failed my first two businesses. And when I say it failed them, it's because my first business, my partner was too wealthy. So basically when things got tough, she ditched me, okay? My second one basically was only interested in doing certain things and she had a, she had another job. And so when it came down to it, she just did the math and figured, okay, no, I'm going to only do these certain things. I don't want to do other things. And it, like even my current business today, I'm very lucky my current co-founder, obviously we've gone the whole way. But if we're in different positions, the problem with this career will be, number one, how much skin in the game is there for both of you? Because if you're putting your own assets into this, whose house is being, whose, whose house is on the hook, right? for all the loans, all of the, all the things that are gonna be happening. The second problem with also people having different uh, financial positions, the exit amount will be very different. If some one of person is actually in a position to basically get to an exit point, but don't necessarily need a certain number to feel that, they're, that they've actually been successful, that can be a major problem. And I can tell you, like, we certainly did have our own problems when we were negotiating for everything from our acquisition to even investment, right? What we, my husband and I actually worked in our business together with a third party, like another co-founder, what we agreed upon wouldn't necessarily be the same because we're in different financial positions. And so when I was okay with something, he might not be, and likewise. And so therefore, you may never actually get to an exit point or, or ever raise money or ever get a loan because... One person may not want to give up the house when another person maybe doesn't have a house, right? So these are just examples where you really need to think about this part really carefully. Um, the support of the family, I mentioned the support of the co-founder. And of course, um, the fourth one I put here is where you might raise. 
And so even though this is a conversation about bootstrapping, I want to emphasize that you never close the door. So whatever you're doing, you never say, I'm never going to raise, right? Because you never know. Uh, I never, ever thought I was going to sell my business. And the right opportunity came upon. Uh, we were offered the right opportunity. It was the right time. Um, and we managed to all agree, right? And again, if you asked me five years ago when I started it, never would have even crossed my mind we would sell to private equity. But we did. And so therefore, you never close any door. And so whatever you're planning to do today, I would recommend you consider at least these three things, right? So one is where do you plan to grow possibly when in a market? Not necessarily today, but where do you plan to really grow from a revenue perspective? Where do you plan to raise money from an in, possibly from an investment perspective, right? Or even borrow money if that's the case. And then the other thing, of course, is getting your paperwork like really, really down. Um, I'll I can talk a little bit more about due diligence further on because that was a major, major, major problem for us. Um, unanimous shareholder agreements, if you have a co-founder, are absolutely pivotal because once you've achieved something, you will not agree again when you had nothing. And we actually had a problem in our unanimous shareholder agreement and we, all three of us, three co-founders in the startup could not agree to change it. We just couldn't agree. It's also possibly one of the reasons why we moved eventually to being acquired because we just couldn't agree on certain things and certain changes. So it's actually worse, by the way, if it's family or friends, it's absolutely worse because you might not have family and friends afterwards, right? So I highly, highly emphasize these, these things to people. Some clauses and some things that you put into an agreement may not fly in the US versus Canada and whatnot. So you really need to think about it at the stage that you are today, even if you're just bootstrapping today, because when you've achieved and achieved a certain amount of result and you've put in so much sacrifice already, invested already, uh, it, you'll never possibly be able to renegotiate as you were on day one. So it's something to really think about in that sense. Resourcefulness, I kind of probably don't have to tell anybody here. Um, bartering of services is so common, you wouldn't believe it. I mean, I commonly still to this day trade things with founders. Hey, can you help me with this one thing? Hey, what do you know about this and that? Like constantly, it's still common. Um, and personal networks are always like, you obviously want to keep building those and keep working on them. I'm going to talk a little bit about Sorry, business Karen. structure. Is there stuff in the chat? Because I see this little red dot moving, yeah. Yes. So there is a question. Brian wants to know, wait, let me just go back to his message here. I'm still amazed by the term exit when founders consider it very early in the development of a business. Would it not confuse or diminish the building efforts of a founder if they're already eyeballing a way out? That's exactly actually, it's funny, Brian, that you say that. That's exactly what I thought. I, that was my exact response to every person who asked me that question. And I absolutely think, yes, you don't necessarily want to think about exit as you don't, you're not planning your entire business around exit. Some people do actually, I gotta say a lot of people do. Um, and that isn't often very successful unless you've actually done it multiple times. But the thing is, I think you want to consider it in certain things. So for example, business structure is one and it's timely that we're on this right page. because so I was going to talk a little bit about that. So one of the things that you, the reason why I say, uh, you know, exit is important is if you ever, like, first of all, you also, you, you both have to agree, or if you have found co different co-founders or if you have different stakeholders, whether it be family or partners or whatever else, you kind of have to agree on what you're building and you kind of have to agree. Are you building a lifestyle business or are you building a business that you want to scale up and, and sustain? The whole idea of raising financing actually to me is not necessarily as important as those first two, because I have certainly friends that have disagreed simply on the basis of one founder wanted to had certain skills and services and wanted to build a certain thing, but they wanted to build a lifestyle business where they wouldn't necessarily have to work and try to hit the growth trajectories to actually bring in institutional founders. They didn't want to build basically a brand name, a business that everybody in Canada knew. They wanted to build a business that allowed them to live on a very comfortable month. You know, every month they're going to make, I don't know, 20, 30 K, that type of thing. Right. That's very easily possible in entrepreneurship. Right. But 
if the other founder wants to basically build an Uber or Shopify, then you've got a problem because you're going to want to achieve very different things. And so therefore, that's the only reason why I would say, I think you should just align to make sure everybody understands kind of what the potential options are, and then obviously close as few doors as you can towards it. That part I get. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, uh, especially if you're bringing on, I've had a bad partnership. I mean, he yeah. got on drugs and that was a whole other story. But um, I, I understand if you're, you know, you need to align with the right partner. Yep. I was just more in reference with that term exit. Like it's, I couldn't picture or fathom building something with the intent of leaving it. I mean, oh, absolutely. I mean, I'm still, like I said, but I hear it tossed around a lot. Even when we meet, everyone's like, oh, so how, what's your exit? An exit. It's like, I'm still- you're planning to die basically in the business, right? Because that's what I always did. I always thought I would just, you know, it'd have to carry me out type of thing, right? Okay. Um, I'm just, and I'm wondering, I 100% agree. I'm wondering how valuable. Sorry, go ahead. I'm wondering how valuable that exit sort of strategy is. I still, I guess I'm, I know everyone else looks at it. I'm just, I keep hearing it a lot, and I wasn't sure if that's something should be done like at the early stages, you know? What I'm, so, no, I, I, the, the, well, the only one I, I actually usually emphasize is business structure because this is the hardest to change, right? Um, I emphasize, and I'll, I, I was actually going to go over some of this right now um, because the way you set up the business will kind of cut off certain doors for you, depending on how you set it up, right? And what you plan to do. So, that's kind of the only thing I would say that if you do things in a certain way, might close certain doors, right? The, to me, starting a bootstrap business, the best way to manage it is always, as I said, to close as few doors as you can so that you have an option. The more options you have, the more choice you have is all it is. So when I say business structure, I'm talking about, you know, are we doing a car- partnership, a corporation, a federal, a provincial corporation? Are we re- opening in the US? Are we, you know, all of this is what I mean by I, I, literally corporate governance, right? Or am I just opening a sole proprietorship? Okay, so usually business structure does matter significantly. And my favorite one is taxes. So so when I say, so I'm going to just talk about it here. So since you kind of brought this up, if that's okay, Brian, I'm just going to go over some of the the points here. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, why does business structure matter? Right. So there's kind of two groups for me, at least when I first started my business. And now if I were to do another business again, there's a significant and there's lower impact. Again, this all depends on you. Is it important to you or not, right? Your situation, how much money or cash flow you have. The most significant impact is actually kind of the most boring stuff, right? But when I say the business structure, as I mentioned, changing the type of business you are from, let's say, a corporation, a federal corporation, a Canadian company, you know, basically incorporated in Canada versus something incorporated in the US, that is actually quite difficult to change once there's actually history. And it can actually make it a bit harder for things like due diligence when you get to, let's say, an acquisition stage, right? Um, Those types of things usually create a lot of problems later on also when you talk about things like possibly doing institutional financing, right? So again, because there's different, so I took that here. So the impact of this business structure decision will change how you can raise money, how you can get loans, and what markets you can go into. Right. So how you which which country and which jurisdiction you incorporate in changes essentially where you register things like IP changes where your labor laws fall. So many things change depending on where you are and how you set up your company. Right. Uh, The options you choose for your company will change a lot of those things. The third and fourth are probably the most important, of course, legal liability. If you're not incorporated or you're incorporated, anybody buying your business, when you say you're not incorporated, That usually is like, oh, I'm on the hook for everything that happens in this business because there's no layer of protection, right? Especially with the U.S. investors or U.S. buyers, because every U.S. company, everybody here is probably aware, uses a holding company to hold the holding company to hold the next company. They're doing that because they're trying to protect themselves with layers, right? So an incorporation is a protection for legal liability for the buyer, not just for you, or of course, for investors. And my favorite one, which is the one I totally didn't know is, and we were lucky, we kind of did it in a way that works, is taxes in Canada as a business owner. If you are selling a business as a bootstrap founder, there are major tax benefits. And so one of the ones that we did not know about when we were, when we were actually um, selling the business, we found this out as we were doing the due diligence, as we brought in tax advisors, 
if your business has a clean cap table, so you do not have an outside non-operational person on the business, so all the founders or all the shareholders basically are active in the business, your business is eligible to the lifetime capital gains exemption in Canada. I, of course, you obviously still need should go to talk to an accountant about this in detail, but I can tell you right now that either way, if you do qualify for this LCGE, you actually will save up to $900,000 per person, right, in taxes. And so there are actually major tax benefits to the way you structure the business. So I can tell you, my husband and I own 60% of the, the one of the businesses that we sold. And so therefore, we were both eligible because my husband and I were both operational in the business. We were lucky. That means my husband and I had $1.8 million tax exempt. Well, not tax exempt. I should say eligible for the capital gains exemption. So again, like some people are like, well, I'll just add my spouse in at the last minute. That doesn't work, by the way. The government actually tracks that. So again, how you set that up. But adding somebody in last minute as a shareholder in a business that's making money, your co-founder is probably not going to let you do that right? But at no cost. So again, this is why the structure matters because, and also the other thing is um, IP and assets are a big problem too, right? Because whatever you've built up, whatever you've purchased, how those things are owned matter because when somebody buys you and they're buying your IP, whether you're incorporated or not, again, is a pretty big, it's very, very important for things like how people may be able to apply for patents, apply to do all types of things. So, Again, not necessarily relevant in all businesses, right? A lot of SaaS businesses don't necessarily have to think about it because they are building things for pro with process patents possibly, or maybe not even patents, but people who are doing obviously things that have algorithms or whatnot may want to consider again, how to, how to manage that. The, I would say lower impact, but still impactful things that you need to consider in the type of business. The last four that I wrote here, right? Running costs is a given. Corporations cost a lot more money to run than obviously running um, any type of sole proprietorship, right? When you do a tax, you usually have to, you have to do um, at least, you don't have to do an audit, but you'll have to do what we call a notice to reader, which is more expensive. So you're talking at least, you know, three to five grand for a tax return at the end of the year versus as for a sole proprietor. Um, you're going to have to be much more careful about you know, the type of expenses you write in and out of the business. There's some major tax advantages too, but you have to be very much more careful, right? With your expenses, your all your documentation, your billing, the administrative overhead of, of having a corporation and filing those types of returns. But if you don't hire somebody, you have to do them yourself. The other thing that I think is very important here is the grants and non-dilutive funding. Um, myself, I actually raised about 600,000 non-dilutive government funding. Uh, all the money went towards hiring in Canada. We never outsourced, but I wouldn't have been able to get that if I wasn't incorporated and if I wasn't doing notice to readers. The government usually will not give grants, large grants, to any type of high tech, like we use Shred, for example, and we also had certain funding from other groups, like including IRAP. And so the, they want to see usually notice to readers because then they know at least the books are of a certain caliber before they're willing to, for example, give you grant money. So these types of things also matter if you're planning to, to actually utilize some of these great resources we have in Canada. Um, the ease of unwinding is again, something we don't like to talk about as Brian's been talking about. You don't wanna talk about exit. You don't wanna talk about closing the business and not working, but let me tell you, it's pretty messy if you don't have things thought about, right? When we signed our unanimous shareholder agreement with our co-founder to start our startup, we actually, did talk about dissolution because we couldn't agree on a shotgun clause. We couldn't agree on certain clauses. So if we knew that that was the case, we'd rather at least know if some this doesn't work out, if it just blows up in our face, how do we get out of this without, you know, take taking all our assets with us, right? So it's just something to think about. I wouldn't say it's necessarily the more important thing. The most important thing is obviously building and growing the business, but they do have major impact and they could have impact much further down the road than you think. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the unconventional. I call Sorry, it Karen, can I jump in? There's a question relevant to the previous slide. Uh, Faria wants to know, what if you're already incorporated in Canada uh, for loans, grants, but want to focus on U.S. and cooperate there for investment purposes? 
Well, if you want to incorporate in the U.S., um, you, you certainly can, of course. Uh, most people usually do. You don't necessarily need it to raise money these days, at least to my understanding. I think NAFIS and, and some of the wise space people are probably a little bit more well-versed than I would, especially if you're planning to raise. I know that most U.S. investors knew that we were incorporated in Canada. Most of the co-founders and founders I know raise money in the U.S. without incorporating in the U.S., but you will probably eventually be asked to do so because that's usually the intention of most U.S. investments is that they do want you to do that, right? There are major tax implications when you open companies in both countries, by the way. You actually will be liable to report taxes usually in both countries at that point. And so when you do that is important, I would say, unless you think it's important enough that you're not going to get financing, you might not want to do it because it's a lot of work with the taxation impact on both. And the tax return requirements in the U.S. are very, very heavy. Um, so something to talk to a tax accountant about and possibly look at, okay, is this really a barrier before you take on that extra that extra cost and also the hassle, really? Got it. And there's another question from Yvonne. Um, sorry, it was a bit up. At why, what point did you reach out to lawyers to establish all these documents? I think it was... She's referring to earlier when you were talking about your story. Agreement? Yeah. Okay. So we did the unanimous shareholder agreement when we were negotiating basically how we were going to split the business and how much shareholding we were going to give to each other. Before we started and before we incorporated, we had the discussion. My advice here is please find a lawyer in the industry in which you're trying to work. That was our mistake. I went to my dad's like business lawyer. That was a mistake because he basically dealt with conventional businesses. He did not know what, for example, a tech unanimous shareholder agreement looks like. And so we had clauses that were not common in those types of agreements. Like we were lucky we had the agreement, but we had these clauses which actually were not helpful because they actually caused problems when we actually got to raising or pitching and any due diligence with certain types of investors because these that have been added in, they're normal in, let's say, the sale of a car dealership, but they're not normal in a tech business. So make sure you, you and I mean, there's lots of great ones, like Mars has them, I know Wisebase has access to them. And so there are great templates out there. You could utilize those, because those would still be better than using something that's not suited for the industry, right? Um, but of course, there are also a lot of great lawyers out there that actually specialize in this, right? There's a lot of really good boutique lawyers that actually don't charge necessarily as much as the main Bay Street lawyers do, right? So those are ways in which you can get around it as long as you make sure that they've done this before. Cool. Okay, cool. I know I'm in the interest of time, I'm gonna to try to move ahead on this, but um, I'm gonna talk about the unconventional because there's ways to turbocharge the bootstrapping um, I'll just give you a couple of basic examples because I actually did one of these and I'm going to quickly talk about pros and cons because it's very, 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 the, the, the difference in doing this versus, let's say, a, a conventional bootstrap business is that there's actually some serious effort and serious resources required. So when I talk about unconventional, I'm usually talking about these three examples, right? I actually basically um, funded and started my SaaS startup by using the, the revenue from a failed business that I turned around. I was able to acquire the failed business for almost very, very little. But I, when I say sweat equity, I mean sweat equity. I mean, we were in the first month of the, of the failed business that we took over, we were hacked by a disgruntled employee because the person who sold me the business didn't even change the passwords on the business and all types of things. And, and so like, this is what I'm talking about. When you're taking on a failed business, there's a reason why it's failing. Let's put it that way. Right. And so therefore the way in which you take it over is important. I was lucky. I did not buy the business. I just took over. I bought the customer base and I buy, I bought the rights to resell certain things. So I did that to kind of isolate and insulate us, but it didn't insulate us from angry customers. It didn't insulate us from the work. I think we were sleeping four hours a day for like three years, like the first three years. And so when you buy a failing business, you are truly taking on possibly a mess. But, and this is the big but for me, I bought a business that had 3,000 customers that hated the business, but they couldn't leave. So I bought a sticky customer base and they all hated us. So it took us three years to turn the business around to make them actually like us enough to keep paying us. 
And I use that money to basically finance. And as you can imagine, it meant I ran two businesses at the same time with all the same amount of work with the same amount of people, right? And so huge and heavy lift, massive sacrifice in time, massive sacrifice in terms of assets. When we ran out of money, I had to put the money in myself, right? There was times when the filling business had issues because, you know, there was seasonality that I didn't know about the first year, right? That's another thing you don't think about. Whenever you buy a business or you take on a business, everybody shows you the best month. Nobody ever shows you the month when like there's no sales or the, or the sales are slow. They give you the best month or they average it. Like never do that. Always make sure you actually get at least the monthly and then you actually have to audit all of that stuff. But this is just an example, right? But it turbocharges the bootstrapping. So when I say turbocharged, when I built my SaaS platform, I had a captive audience of a couple thousand customers who are now, by the way, generally happy who I could now migrate to my new platform. And so I built for the same platform because it was the same customer base, but it was my modern platform. And I essentially kept this business alive with, I didn't invest that much in it because all my investment went into the SaaS platform, but I basically did it this way because I just wanted to keep the audience for the longest possible time. So I had somebody that I could market towards. And actually we launched, we started the business, the SaaS business in 2018. I acquired the conventional, so the failing business in 2016. And we actually only launched the the uh, the SaaS platform basically uh, late last summer. But we've been moving customers pretty quickly now over. So part of this is there's a plan in there somewhere, and that's the goal. It doesn't mean it's going to happen. We were very lucky it worked out for us, and we were lucky the acquisition helped us toward it. But again, like you have to know what you're taking on. Same with the other two. Uh, these are things I always tell people because everybody talks about, oh, I'm going to start a SaaS. I'm going to raise money or I'm going to do this and I'm going to build, I'm going to bootstrap something with bubble first, right? You can do that. But there's things, there's ways to do it faster if you can do that sacrifice. And again, businesses without succession plans are pretty much most of the small to medium-sized businesses out there today. The business that we took that was a failing business, it was a failing business because it was a business without a succession plan. The owner of the of the legacy, basically retail point of sale company that we basically uh, took on the operations for, his kids didn't want the business. He was on vacation nine months of the year, and he was basically going to let it run into the ground. And so they're usually hand in hand, one and two, but it's something to think about if you come across that opportunity. And it's weird because I know at least two, three other people in my industry that took over their businesses like this. One guy was, was the, the, my, my favorite story was he was actually pumping gas. He was actually the gas, he was the gas attendant at a full service station. And he happened to talk to the owner of the business. And the guy was so fed up. He's like telling him all the story. And the guy's like, you know what, can I come help you and try this? And the guy's like, okay, whatever, just show up tomorrow. He shows up tomorrow. He works really hard. And in the end, the guy let him buy the business for like, I think $50,000, but it was a profitable business. And so it can happen if you know where you're looking and you can find these gems, right? But again, pro versus con is basically whatever sacrifice you're planning to do, just double that. And then you'll know whether or not that cost is something you can afford. Um, I'm not necessarily going to go through all of this. I know we're going to share all of these things, but I mean, these are things that people talk about all the time, right? The things you prioritize. I don't have to tell you, obviously, prioritizing spend and time. I would emphasize like four and five and six more than the first three, because I think the first three are usually commonly talked about already. The last three. So one is like, there's so many tools out there today to automate things that you can do a lot with a lot less people because you can automate it, right? But before you do that automation, make sure you know what that true cost is. A lot of people put in processes and don't realize every process has a cost, right? So you got to write that off properly. You need to make sure you're doing that correctly. Because I use quite a lot of automation, but um, a lot of people, you know, sometimes don't want to bother with it. But in the end, it means I can run the same amount of business with five people that might take 10, 15, 20 people in another business, right? Cash flow is king. Again, pretty obvious statement. 
But when you're starting that, this is for the people who probably maybe are early stage in this conversation, uh, forget budget, only look at cash flow because cash flow is way more important than budget. You can budget for anything, but if the money doesn't arrive in your account net of all fees, that it doesn't matter what your budget is, right? So again, there's sometimes a lot of emphasis on budget. I would say, make sure you actually truly understand what cash flow means. And that includes your credit card bills and your property taxes and your mortgages and all that other stuff, right? Um, and the last one I think is the one that sometimes isn't emphasized as much because people like, well, feel that it's easy to outsource. Yes, it is easy to outsource. You can get somebody on Fiverr, you can get somebody on Upwork to do you know, a website and all these other things for you. But sales and marketing are probably the easiest things out of everything in a business to at least bootstrap in the beginning yourself. So that means whether it's using Canva, whether it's building a website, whether it's creating a graphic, to have the ability, if you need to create a landing page in 10 minutes because you need to whip up a website because somebody said, hey, I need you, can you send over some information about the comp about this product that you're talking about? And you can whip that up in 10 minutes instead of begging somebody to build it for you. That is usually the difference between closing five deals a month versus you know one a month. And I changed, we were changing the landing pages, changing our assets, changing our graphics, changing everything constantly, right? Constantly changing all the documentation. And then we would be, we would do it at 2 a.m. because we got a pitch in the morning, right? So this is something that I know a lot more people can do today, but it's just something to remind yourself. If you're going to learn a skill, not to say, you know, language is like my husband luckily speaks like five, right? So it, it, we lucked out with him. But I would say if you're going to run a business, this is probably the closest thing to looking like you have a very big sales team when you don't and all you have is a landing page, right? Um, and something I always usually emphasize, people at least learn kind of the basics on or have somebody you trust who can help you, whether that's a relative or, you know, your kid or anything like that. Um, I know we're kind of running over an hour, right, Lena? Yeah, we're, I think we're doing good on time. These are all, I'm fairly certain, you know, well known brands that you guys are aware of. MailChimp, you know, the marketing email marketing platform, they started in 2001, so 20 years before they were actually finally acquired. They were 100% bootstrapped when they were acquired. They were sold for $12 billion in cash and stock to Intuit. So they, the owners of QuickBooks, right? So this is an example of a business that bootstrapped it from the very beginning and kept growing and growing. And they kept reinvesting into the business and into the actual product. They were very much a product-driven business for the longest time until they got a huge amount of traction. They were really smart with their freemium pricing models. I think they were quite actually early on to do those types of things. And so another great example of what you can do when you have a, a really sharp product and you know how to make it integrate with lots of tools and platforms, right? Spanx is, I like to throw in something that's non-tech just because first of all, people talk about tech being obviously the only way in which to grow a lot of things really quickly, but there's some really great bootstrap products. And sometimes some of the, well, really not sometimes, some of the biggest companies in the world are companies that sell physical things. And so Sarah Blakely in the UK, actually when she built Spanx, it was, she had to take $5,000 because nobody would listen to her. She actually put up that money. She had to borrow that money, if I remember correctly. And she created the first prototypes. She sold it into some of the major department stores using a prototype that she'd cut from, you know, just some samples that she had sewn together. And she was able to sell a majority stake in 2021. Again, 21 years for this bootstrap to actually pay off, right? One password is Canadian. Uh, 2005, they actually just only raised in 2019, right? So most people know this obviously as the password crypt. I'm not going to necessarily go into, there's obviously a lot of information you can find online about these companies in terms of what they did differently. But I guess the most important thing here is to say, number one, bootstrapping can truly pay off 
with the right time horizon and with the right market. One password really picked up during COVID and the pandemic, right? Spanx picked up after a, a certain stage, especially with the, in, the growth of Instagram and social media. Timing is everything. MailChimp sold into, into it just around like post pandemic when people were all about certain things and, and into it didn't have a way in which to add a marketing tool into their QuickBooks platform, right? So timing of the market combined with most of these businesses are well over 10 years investment, right? So 10, 20 years investment, but they truly will pay off with, you know, especially from, if you look at, look at what they've done, usually from very, very little $5,000 to 1.2 billion valuation, right? So this is something that can be done in every spectrum. And I've seen it across so many. Um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about myself because I think you guys may want to hear a little bit about my own story. Um, of course, you know, I'll go into some of the detail. I don't want, I, some of the stuff may, if I can't talk about it, I'll let you guys know. But I actually had two failed businesses myself in my early days. My wholesale business, which is called DMW, was a wholesale candle business in, it was in Can in Markham, actually. Uh, 2005, I was in my late 20s. I thought I knew everything. I thought I could build anything. I thought I could, you know, I didn't need any help. And that did not last long, let's just say. I ended up, you know, luckily renegotiating, getting out of our rental leases when we shut it down. And then I moved to Asia actually for eight years because I wanted to experience more of the world. I was in my late 20s with my husband, the two of us moved there. We started working in, you know, a very similar business. We actually got the job opportunities at a trade show when we were displaying the last two trade shows of my failed business. And they, they liked what we were building. And this I essentially ended up taking over the manufacturing facilities for a candle manufacturer um, in Southern China. So I ended up basically running manufacturing operations. And later on, I thought, I guess I wasn't busy enough. We decided to start a retail business in Taiwan. And that was an omni-channel business. So we had online store, in-store. And this is where I say the tech was really crap at the time. It was 2012 when we started this. Like there was no way for us to track anything through the cloud yet. Everything was horrible. The, the point of sale systems really were not suited for high volume transactions or high volume of product. You couldn't do any margin calculation. The conversion between languages and countries was horrible. Like this is the type of problem we were having at the time. And when we decided to come back, one of the reasons as I mentioned was my partner kind of ditching us because she was too wealthy. But when we came back, and I also came back as my family's here. I was born in Canada. My mom and dad were getting older. We wanted to be good kids, so we came back. And we kind of said we were going to get jobs. And then, like, four months later, we took over this failing business because we were like, we just couldn't do it, right? We There was just an opportunity for us to build what we said, oh, that really sucked in Taiwan, so let's just do that, right? And we didn't even necessarily think about, like, the whole... SaaS startup to excel to using accelerators to raise investment. We mainly thought about, okay, if we take on this, I've got the customer base. I know we can build something better. At the time, we thought we would just take what we had and then kind of essentially either rebuild it or update it. But once we took it on, we realized, you know, we lifted the carpet and it was like, oh my God, the worms were just, there were so many problems under the carpet. And so we decided, okay, we have to rebuild it. If we're going to rebuild this, then we need to make sure we have a technical partner. And that's kind of where this whole partner discussion I mentioned to you guys came up and the whole business structure thing came up. The only reason why I knew to do those things is because of the first two failed businesses when I didn't actually do those things properly. And when the person wanted to leave, they just left kind of thing, right? So we made it harder for things like IP. We made it harder if somebody wanted to leave because they had something vested in the business. But even then, of course, like I said, we made mistakes, right? We didn't get a tech lawyer to actually do the agreement, which created more problems. So in 2018, we did start to build the SaaS platform. Um, we had the partner at that point, the technical founder, who obviously is the one that went with us all the way to exit. So in our particular instance, it worked out really well because the private equity firm, the, it's a U.S. private equity firm that specializes in B2B, and they have an entire kind of section that is that specializes in our sector, retail point of sale, essentially. And they were, they actually, their strategy was actually a roll up. So a roll up is a situation where you take a legacy business and you essentially try to migrate that business onto the newer platforms. 
and you buy the businesses from us cheaper. We were a very interesting buy for them because I had the legacy customer base and I had an almost completed startup. And so for them, it was like, hey, this is like pretty, like usually private equity doesn't buy a non-revenue generating business. It's not even common at all for them to buy this early stage. But because we had revenue and because we actually had all of these uh, basically customers, and by the way, having revenue was really important for my being able to get government funding and government grants, because a lot of those grants do require you to have revenue requirements, right? So it meant that we actually qualified for a lot of these things. And we somehow fell under their radar because they were actually looking at my legacy business and realized, hey, there's a potential for us to buy these guys. Their tech actually is what we've been trying to buy. And we could just build it out instead and actually do the acquisition this way. And so it was an unusual buy for them. And it was an unusual acquisition for us because at that point we were obviously having some difficulties with raising. But I'm gonna emphasize to you timing again. 2012, or sorry, 2022, we actually sold in May. We got our LO, like the offer in at the end of January, 2022. If you guys recall, the market fell off a cliff in April for tech. And we were very lucky. They didn't even renegotiate and we closed that deal one month. But at that point, you know, by the end of 2022, the market had completely tanked. And obviously with inflation where everything is, it's been very difficult finance situation. So if we had not sold the business I'm not sure we necessarily would have been able to get through the rest of this, right? Because what they've done after acquiring us is they wanted me to run the business. They wanted me to finish the build out and they invested in us to do it. And we actually asked them to basically continue growing this in Canada. We wanted to, our entire operations to this day are hundred percent based in Canada. All of our staff are Canadian. We don't actually even use contractors. And so for us, this whole strategy of building within Canada for them was was great because it made sense from a tax perspective because we have an entire customer base in Canada that we can not only use as a focus group, we can actually sell into at the same time. So for us, it was lucky and also good timing, I think, right? Besides obviously all the hard work. And that's what I meant about some of those earlier things. Some of the things you do will end up being to your benefit and some of the things you do may not be, right? But if you at least kind of consider them in your decisions early on, that's usually all that you can do, right? But it, it obviously can make a huge impact. Um, I know we're kind of running through on time. So some of the things that I've put here, I know most of you guys have heard of them probably. There are free versions of almost anything, right? And you absolutely use the free versions of everything until you absolutely cannot. And when you cannot, the only time is you have enough revenue to cover that cost, right? That's usually the only way you would look at it. And I say that because, for example, there's so many people who don't know, apparently, the Google Calendar, if you're using Google Workspace, they have a calendar function now that basically is exactly the same as Calendly, but you don't have to pay for it. And it gives you the exact same functions, which you can send out links for people who don't cost you anything. And if you're using it with Google Meet, you don't even have to pay for Zoom to do anything like your recordings and stuff, right? So again, lots and lots of options. Um, I'm not necessarily going to go through this because I'm sure there's people who are better at this, but I mean, if people have questions, I can happy to, you know, give suggestions on, on the things that we do use, but I thought it would be at least important to throw something in here to, to emphasize at least the five, six key areas, which is obviously accounting, finance, your MVP, uh, if you're doing anything with coding. The CRM is the one, by the way, that most people don't do. I always find it really surprising because CRM is probably the only thing in all of these that I probably would spend money on. And because the reason why is the CRM allows you to have one person manage all your sales as opposed to a team of salespeople. To this day, our business has, we only have one person, one salesperson in-house. And it's because she uses the CRM and we automate everything using automation. So she only deals with stuff that's warm. Everything else before that is an early stage funnel is all workflow automation. Right. So, but I don't, you don't have to use it to that stage, but what you do need to do is have a way to basically track every interaction with the customer in one place. A lot of people end up using Excel sheets. It's fine for maybe the first five customers. It's not going to be fine when you're doing any real lead gen and any real marketing, and you don't even need to use to do paid, right? Email marketing is probably the best marketing there is out there. Blog marketing, all of those things are easier. 
They take time, but it's content that you can create at no cost to yourself, right? And so I always, always emphasize CRM because nine out of 10 startup founders don't do it until they absolutely need to do it. And then they are like, oh, we can't scale fast enough. Well, you can't scale fast enough because you don't have a CRM to track stuff, right? And more importantly, you can't take a vacation because like, who's going to know who called who, right? If you don't have a way for you to log in through cloud to check who's touched that customer. So that's something I always kind of emphasize just for sanity um, earlier on, if you can, because then it doesn't become a hassle to set up in the future. Uh, recommended reading. These are things you guys probably already know, but a couple great, you know, great books that I always emphasize is the Lean Startup. I love, I don't even know if I'm pronouncing it right, is Saster, you know, his, his site is the best if you are building a SaaS platform. Like the stuff he goes in detail on in like, when do you hire a VP of sales? When do you do this and that? It's it's well worth it if you are building SaaS and if you haven't heard of it. And most of you probably already have, but I would definitely emphasize that you look there. Um, the bios of founders that you admire and in not necessarily your own industry, but of course you should check everybody in your industry if you can. That's the best hack you can have because you're probably never going to meet these people, right? Uh, most people will tell you everything that they've done. I, I've tried to tell you guys some of the things I've done. Hopefully some of it's been helpful. You know, as they say, right? You don't want to walk through everybody and make every mistake that we've all made, right? So if you can learn from somebody else who's kind of done it and you get one nugget out of that book, that book is worth reading. Um... I'm kind of just basically ending off here. So the support network, I think is really, really important because people usually, once you become a bootstrap entrepreneur, you don't have time to breathe. So you don't have time to do anything and you don't want to go network because you don't want to put on, you know, jeans, you just want to wear sweats all the time. And so I emphasize that you really do need peers. The peers are really important. I always talk about Yspace because Yspace has accelerator programs. With master classes, uh, it was amazing because we we were able to have a, a group of peers where we could talk intimately about the problems we have. Um, I make it, I emphasize it here because a lot of people don't reach out because they think it's extra work. Oh, they think they're not helping me exactly in what I'm doing. The workshops are obviously important, and I'm glad you showed up here today. But it's really the peers that are the most important. My closest friends today are all founders. And every single one of them, I can tell you, have helped me at some point and I've helped them. And they're the only people who could truly understand why they need to help you at 2 a.m. because you have a meeting at 8 a.m. They're the only people who will help you at that time, by the way, too. So make sure you keep up those connections because they're well worth it. And um, industry-specific associations are worth it if you're building something that requires you to be I'd say kind of an influencer or at least an authority figure in that space. So I'm in the retail tech space. I've been in retail for a very long time. Um, I'm actually on the Retail Wire Brain Trust, for example. They invited me on it. It takes effort to be on these groups, but it's well worth it again because I will post about certain topics and I will get people reach out to us. Some of our leads come through this way easily because they're like, oh, Karen knows about this thing. And so therefore they'll, they'll write to me, hey, I saw your article about this. I saw your comment about this. You know, so again, very worth it if this is where your leads will probably live. Um, it sometimes feels like it's not, you know, you don't have the time to do it, but these are the types of things where they pay off if you keep maintaining them. And if you don't, it'll take you six months to build them up again. So that's kind of why I always tell people not to stop. Alina, I've been talking for a very long time, so I don't know if there's questions from people but or if i've been going too fast i hope i haven't uh and uh if if people do have questions i'm happy to take them amazing thank you so much uh karen this was amazing it was so fantastic loved all your resources and all the experience that you brought to the workshop amazing lots of great comments for you in the chat as well but we'll open the room for questions now so folks if you have questions for karen go ahead you can unmute and ask away as well. Ooh, I like what Nafis wrote. He wrote about an AI grant writing. I didn't even know about this. See, the things were getting better and better all the time. I remember writing those. I had this entire template for grant writing. Like you, you everybody just reuses chunks and sections, right? So the fact that there's actually groups to do that, 
There's apparently also a legal one. Now, what is it called? Spellbook.ai, who actually does legal AI for you for a certain amount of contracts and things like that. So interesting. So Karen, I'll just um, piggy bank on that uh, comment in the chat. Uh, you said that you raised quite a few uh, funds through non-dilutive funding and grants. Yes. How did you go about finding what grants are out there, applying to those? What was that process like for you? Well, I mean, I actually make an effort to to keep in contact with all the different advisors in different groups, right? So everybody from IRAP, uh, now OCI, and even local groups, right? Uh, a lot of the small business entrepreneurship groups have connections to a lot of funding. For example, most people don't realize COJG uh, is, for example, one of the funding programs in Ontario for training. So you can get a lot of coverage. So we were able to utilize those types of things to cut down the cost. We had developers that we were we had developers that were working on one platform. And we were like, maybe we can make them work on both. So how can we do that? Okay, let's see if we can actually upskill them. How can we upskill them? We don't have the money to to train them. So what do we do? So we basically went to COJG. They gave us like sixty or seventy percent of the funding to basically get retrain my staff, and we were able to essentially help him learn the new tools and the new code and the new languages and the new tech stack. So now he's able to work on both platforms, right? So this is an example of where you're looking for every possible opportunity, right? SWPP, which is the uh, program, I think Weiss, uh, York University, maybe Space also had, yeah. utilizes and offers that, right? Great programs where you can get coverage of, is it, What's the coverage nowadays, Alina? I'm not, I don't remember the it's last It's between 5,000 to 7,000. Exactly, right? Which is more than enough usually for summer students, right? So we've used those for summer students. I've basically brought on uh, financing or grants from for student, summer students all the time. Another great resource most people don't think of using is the co-op programs in high schools. And I know it sounds kind of like, okay, that feels like you're being a little, you're utilizing, you know, young people to actually do work for free. But let me tell you, like they get a lot out of, out of it because you have to put some effort in when they're that green and that young, right? But what I've used young students for from high school is they are getting co-op credit. And most of my social media on all over my social media sites have been created by high schoolers. A lot of my how-to documentation is created by high schoolers. A lot of the, uh, some of the, I've even had them create videos because some of them are just amazing at this type of technology today. They create Canva, they can create videos in Canva. Some of them are animation students and I've had them create little social graphics and, and ads, right? So for me, it was very important to look for every one of those opportunities. And you have to kind of think about, you know, from top to bottom, if you're going to use co-op students, like I pretty much almost exclusively use them for digital marketing, uh, any type of te sometimes technical documentation. I didn't actually utilize them as much for things like dev work because it was very difficult. They didn't have the training necessary and it actually sometimes wasted more of my senior dev time than it was worth it. So you need to know when to use what, right? You can get junior people to do the work that is more tedious, but it still gives them learning experience and value and how, most of it's actually usually free in this case, right? But again, you know, as long as you put in that time. Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Balancing time was the single biggest obstacle I faced. Um, I can tell you that this is where I go back to having the support of your family, your friends, your partner, whoever it is. I, I'll give, I'll tell you one thing that I did, for example, that most people, I, people laugh about it when I tell you. So my bookkeeper was my mom and my mom did all my books from both my companies. And when I went to the acquisition due diligence meetings with KPMG and these big private equity companies, I brought my mom with me. So, I mean, as an example, you can actually bootstrap yourself in ways and use people that you trust, uh, in all different, in all different, like it doesn't, you don't have to be embarrassed about it. I was a little bit embarrassed at first because I actually told the private, I was like, I need to bring somebody with me because I know obviously the books, but if you have a granular question, I won't be able to answer it without my mom next to me, right? But that's what I did. And I didn't pay a bookkeeper for six years. Um, my mom, you know, made me pay her back once we were acquired, but at that point, like it was okay. I just mean that, you know, there are, 
it is important to have that type of support behind you. My sister, who's a very senior salesperson at MasterCard, for example, she helped me quite a lot with things like sales cycles, sales scripts. She, like you have families and connections who can support you, right? That's the only way in which you can kind of get through all of this. And the other thing I would say to you, Alice, is you kind of have to know when you're talking to people who are basically helping you and encouraging you and maybe giving you critical advice that is constructive. You also need to know when you're dealing with the wheel spinners and the people who are putting you down and making your life harder. And you have to kind of know how to shut that out, right? Because I think the biggest problem we have is it's already hard enough and you have nobody to support you half the time because you're the one responsible for everything already. And if you have somebody next to you who's just negative negativity day in, day out, that is that vibe is just going to bring you down and make it harder even, right? So I would say balance requires you to be a little ruthless in who you spend your very limited amount of time in to some extent. I'm not saying don't talk to family if they don't encourage you, right? But I mean, you have to know, don't talk to family about your business if they're not supportive, right? And this is the type of stuff that I think makes that a lot easier. But if somebody is constructive and gives you feedback, take it. Just, I mean, I, 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 you, it's easy to kind of feel almost offended sometimes a little bit because you worked so hard on this and they're being critical, but you've got to learn to take that, absorb it and not let it bother you and learn to do that, right? So whether it's yoga, whether it's meditation, whether my, my husband loves Candy Crush, right? So everybody has a different thing and whatever it takes for you to, to achieve that. Awesome. Uh Karen, let's go to Lyle. Lyle, you can unmute yourself and ask a question. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Alina. Um, Karen Wong, I will not forget your name. You know, people oh. have mentioned this is this is a master. Um, they, they've attended other master classes. For me, this is my master class. You know, you introduced so many concepts and thoughts and considerations. I want to run talk to my partner right now about a bunch of these things. Um, I, I have two questions for you. I have two questions for you, if you don't mind. Um, you talked about failing. You talked about buying and you talked about selling. Mm -hmm. And I'm interested to know what the trigger point was that made you decide to do those three things. And if you could also, in the beginning, you talked about being a non-tech founder. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to know, has that been an impediment or was it irrelevant in your progress? So for the first question, so you're saying failing, buying and selling, right? So the trigger point, when I say failing is like, I think that's the hardest thing, right? You spend all this time and effort to build something and you, it's basically some cost. Being able to walk away from failure is probably the reason why most people never pick themselves up again, right? So for me, I literally had, I just, I actually just did the math, right? I figured out, I sat there one day with my husband and we, in our businesses, they were kind of in the, they were in the red already. And we're like sitting there saying, okay, we've thrown this much money down this hole if we sit here for another six to 12 months, what does that mean? What is the most positive scenario? What is the worst case scenario? And every scenario was red. And we said, okay, forget it. We can't do this. I mean, it was very hard. My husband still to this day, if I mentioned the, one of those businesses, he talks of, he, he just like, that was a house, you know? And, but you, you have to be able to, to do that. You have to be able to walk away. And I guess the most important thing then as a business owner really is, is the loss affordable? Can you afford to walk away from that and not lose absolutely your shirt? Um, because you have to know what that point is. And maybe when you start the business, you need to say, okay, you know what? Like for some people, it could be something like, I will sacrifice anything but my house. I will sacrifice anything but my RSVs or my savings, right? It could be different for every person, but you need to kind of know what that point is. And if you get to that point, it's some hard decisions, right? You, you're tempted to say, okay, no, I'm going to keep going. I'm going to keep going. But nine out of 10 times, that's when you lose your shirt. So that's why I always say you kind of do have to know, gut feel, have I hit that point? And yeah, it's really hard to walk away from money. But now what I tell my husband, every time I raise that, I talk about those failed businesses, I was like, that was tuition, man. It was very, it was probably, it was like 10 times, six times the cost of an MBA, but that was tuition and we paid for it and we got it back, right? That's kind of the only way to think about it for me. The acquisition was a little easy because I got it for almost nothing. I paid like 10 grand for the business. 
the failed, the failed business because the guy wanted to walk away tomorrow. And I knew that I wouldn't have that chance to do it. And I thought, you know what? 10 grand is a lot of money. But if I don't, if I give him 10 grand, I get a customer base and I got a business I can try to fix and I can use that. I saw the revenue stream. He was like minimally at a loss. So I knew if I did the math, that 10 grand, maybe add a couple, you know, a little bit more money, I could probably get it to profitability within six to 12 months. And if I couldn't, then I would walk away and I've only thrown away a year of my life and 10 grand kind of thing, right? And whatever cash flow. So that one was an easy math equation. So when you buy a business, that's why I said the nuggets sometimes are in the, the failing business that no, have no succession in the ones that nobody wants, like the boring business, like, you know how many people, you know, if I had choice today, I probably would have started like a storage facility or something because the business is where you don't need anybody and it, it's super high margins and nobody ever wants to unpack their stuff or leave. Like there's so many of these types of businesses, right? And so the focus on where you look to get, but make sure you get, if you're paying a lot for that business, it's a very different story. So that's why for me, if you're really looking to find that opportunity, looking in these areas that usually get ignored because they're not sexy is basically the best place for me at least. Um, and then in terms of acquisition, we came to that point because we were starting to have number one, uh, disagreements in terms of where we wanted to take the business with our co-founder. So it's usually partner triggered. It actually in all my businesses, it has been. And then the second thing of course, is uh, we got to a point where I was concerned about the economy. We'll go back to my very first sl slide. I mean, I like to read quite a lot of news, not everybody does, and that's fine. But I saw a lot of concerns because my customers are all very economically impacted, right? So when retailers were starting to have problems, I saw it because I saw it in our existing customers. They were telling us, oh man, our, our stock isn't moving. Our products are not moving as fast. And we actually started looking into some of the stats in the data. If we could see inventory slow, like basically starting to pile up because retail sales were slowing across our customers. So that's, that was a trigger to me that, okay, economy is not well, inflation is running rampant, and we're seeing our customers slow down. Even if I use my current trajectory for cash flow, I might be in, in trouble. So if we have an opportunity to exit, we did the math, my husband and I did the math on our own side, and obviously we did it later on with our co-founder, and we decided, okay, it wasn't worth the risk, because the only other way to get to, to, to get the next level up would be like a big raise or something like that. But in this environment, what was going to happen, right? And this is all before, you know, the bank crisis and all these other things that happened. So I would say timing and luck a little bit there with some general math, the back, back of napkin math, I would say is what we did. And I think I forgot the last question. I'm sorry. I was a long right, no, answer. Great, great answer so far. Uh, I just wanted to clarify um, if being a non-tech founder was an impediment oh. or was it irrelevant? It's less and less relevant today. It was, I think, a bit more before because no code didn't really exist when we started all of this, right? I think that being a tech founder matters if you are working in a space, which is what I consider high tech versus kind of more low tech. When I say low tech, it's not that what we do isn't tech, of course it is, right? But what we built is not rocket science. There are people really building rockets, right? So if you're building rockets, you probably should be a technical founder or at least have a technical founder with skin in the game. What we did was more low tech, but the reason why my founder, my co-founder was really pivotal is he had deep experience in the space and my technical co-founder built an accounting system. And I can tell you, I have yet to come across a developer who understands accounting. So it was an unusual skill set that was harder to find, which is why we decided to partner together with him. Um, you know, even though we knew there might be other issues later on, for example, like differences of values or differences of exit goals. Hopefully that answered your question. Well. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Karen. Appreciate it. Amazing. So uh, Karen Faria has a couple of questions in the chat. How did you manage the risks of not having a job and taking a leap into the business? That's the first question. Uh, and were there any lessons learned in your IP journey? So the risk of that, um, this is kind of where we go back to, you know, age, right? So for me, when I first started this whole, the, the first entrepreneurship journey for me, I was in my late twenties. Um, I had a home, but I mean, other than that, I didn't have kids. We, we, we never did end up having kids, right? So for us, 
the risk was lower because the opportunity cost was much lower and we were willing to move to Asia to do those things. Uh, we actually were very lucky because we took some risk with real estate actually in Hong Kong. We moved to Hong Kong um, and at the time it was right before the Occupy movement and all of those things. And, the, and we, when we returned from Asia, we had, we actually, we bought when nobody else was buying when we moved there. And we, it was very hard for us to pay for the cost because they're so expensive, the housing there. But when we returned, we actually sold that property and we were able to leverage some of that. Uh, for my other co-founder friend, founder friends that I know, usually it's the case, reducing risk usually means one spouse is working, right? Or one partner is working. Or of course, it's something like using savings. I usually, usually having a person working is safer just simply because you need to have credit, you need to have maybe have mortgage, you need to have rental income, uh, rental references, all that type of stuff, right? So usually speaking, the biggest risk management will be in your personal asset, your situation with assets. And of course, if there's any type of income stream coming in. I do actually have some other friends though who have also done it by building little apps. So I have friends who have built little apps. They're almost like passive apps that give them a couple thousand here and there. And they utilize that actually to sub subsidize their own living. And then they put everything else into the business. So there's different ways to do it. Um, and whatever you're building, that's possible. I mean, I also, I mean, nowadays I do do some of these mentorship gigs. I actually enjoy doing that. I, I sometimes work with different groups that are supporting, for example, there's a TV show that I work on today that is uh, working with small business owners with accessibility um, it, with accessibility needs. And so things like that I do now, but I know a lot of founders actually will teach on the side too, right? So people will do that to supplement their income. It's another great way to network too. And there was, sorry, one last question. Sorry. Uh, she had a question on your lessons learned uh, on your IP journey. Yes. So we actually did review IP quite a lot. Um, we talked to a number of different legal firms about it, and we obviously went through different programs through accelerators. I think one of the things I would say is, in this case, I would absolutely talk to the accelerator programs today because there are a lot more government programs that support IP. My IP journey is quite different because number one, there were no programs that were as supportive before. I have several friends who actually have spent easily north of $80,000 to get a, you know, provisional patent. And so in the US, it's very easy to spend money on patents. And you may get very little out of it because the friend of mine who actually has a provisional patent, he has the patent on something which Google and Apple actually in, are using today. And he had it before Apple did, but he can't enforce it because he doesn't have the money. And so therefore, if you're going to really think of it as a key cornerstone of your assets, because you are in the high tech space, for example, I would em highly emphasize doing it earlier on, but looking for opportunities and supporting support through grant programs. I know the government has a number of programs supporting that as do accelerator programs now. Uh, for me, the other reason why we actually chose to not emphasize it as much is because a lot of what we built was a combination of interdisciplinary experience based on processes. So for example, what we building inventory management and commerce platforms is nothing new. The way we built it, the tech stack we chose to build it in, the, the complexity and the way we designed it, that was what was different and new, right? The functionality we built into it was new. It was not a novel concept. So for us, that was the only reason why we didn't emphasize necessarily a patent in the processes, but we did obviously do trademarks. We did obviously do all of the basic things that you would do to, to at least own the right to the ass, the basic assets, like obviously owning everything like, you know, the first, whenever you have a business, you start something, the first thing you do is get the domain, right? Get all the social media accounts, get your TikTok account, gets all those first, right? So those things are kind of the minimum that you can do at almost no cost, right? The social media accounts cost nothing. You could get them even before you buy the domain, as long as you make sure you get it, right? So those things I usually do first, but otherwise I, for us at least, it's been less emphasis because I still consider what we do kind of more process oriented IP than, than actually something that we can actually patent per se. Amazing, perfect. And Anmar had a question. 
Uh, is it feasible to start as a home-based business? And what are some legal requirements and challenges? Of course, you can be a home-based business. I think the thing you would have to review is what type of business. So is it a service-based business? Is it Are you selling product? And is it a regulated product? I mean, those are usually the kind of the key three things um, that you want to look at because they would have different regulatory requirements and zoning requirements in wherever you're living. Some cities allow that easily, some cities don't. So something to talk to your local small business center about, or um, if you have an advisor locally. One thing I would also emphasize you talk to is your tax accountant. Uh, I love to talk about taxes because I obviously want to pay the, the required taxes as a good citizen, but at the same time, I don't think anybody here wants to pay extra. And so part of it is thinking about how to structure everything you do. If you are running a home-based business, you really need to think about the way in which you're currently, it, does it actually make sense for you, right? So for some people to run a home-based business may not necessarily make sense at certain tax, at certain revenue levels, because you can't write off certain things, right? When you have a home-based business and you also can have an, I know a lot of people will say, oh, I can actually apply some things like my house, amortization, amortization certain things about my house into it. Some people don't realize if you take certain expenses against your business, when you sell your house, it creates a problem because you're going to trigger taxation issues, right? So you need to, because that house, that part of that house that you've been claiming for 10 years, that 15% might not qualify for your primary residence exemption anymore. So little things like that matter. And so if you are thinking about utilizing an asset like a home, try to think about, okay, maybe I should just double check to see if this is the best way to set it up, right? I've had people do it differently. There's obviously write-offs that the government allows every year. It might be better for you to do it that way, that's all. And that means the way you invoice, the way you you know send out sales receipts might, might differ then. Perfect. Uh, Dana, go for it. Hey, Karen, thank you so much for your all the insights. It was really interesting to hear about your experience. Oh. But my question is, if you're at the beginning of your 20s, and you know all the experiences that you had for the past businesses. Which business would you open like tomorrow, for example? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I would say if I if I had you mean if I had all the experience I had today, I mean I would probably have done a boring business. I would have selected going into a business. I would probably want to use go into a sector where very few people are interested because it's so unsexy and unbo and boring and apply a little bit of tech into it, right? There's so many of them out there, whether it's laundry services, whether it's car washes, it all of those businesses, nobody ever wants to talk about because they're not as cool as saying, I built the latest and greatest AI tool, but the money is unbelievable because it's recurring revenue. It's basically recurring revenue and the cost is very low. Like, for example, I didn't even know window cleaning is apparently the, one of the highest margin services out there. It'll cost you a bucket, a you know, a bucket of water and a sponge and some soap, right? So but again, how you build those services matter. The one thing, though, in my lifestyle is that my husband and I do do digital nomading a couple times a year. So that's the reason why I'd say whatever I do, I would want to do a little bit of tech in it. If you're asking me out of my businesses today, I don't think I could have built my retail business, even though our retail tech business, I mean, I don't think we could have built it without the previous experience. That's the, that's the sad truth though, right? Retail tech is, and retail itself is one of the most interdisciplinary uh, industries there are. You have to understand accounting, inventory management, cash flow management, people management, right? Marketing, social media marketing, you name it, it's, it's covered, right? And so because of all of that, I'm not sure I would have been able to build it without the previous experience. If I did, I probably would do the tech business earlier because it's obviously the greatest thing we do today is probably tech and those who can actually enable more things with tech. Thank you so much for the question or for the answer. All right, Goldie, go ahead. Um, I loved, loved your presentation. It really expanded my brain cells to a whole nother level. And 
I feel like my brain cells are already at a whole other level. So there's there's a lot to <laughs> process. Um, but I really wanted to get your input since you're in the retail space. Um, mm -hmm. I used to be in the retail space, but on the creative side. And I want to know your thoughts on AI when it comes to what's going on now and how you see your business implementing AI for your business's growth. Okay. Um, for my own business, the way, like the tech business I have today, or do you mean in terms of retail business? In the retail business that you have, because I know it's um, a systems based. Yeah, we well, we have, we build retail tech. So we basically build the equivalent of like Lightspeed or Shopify is the easiest way for me to explain what, what we build. Okay. And it's for retail. Yeah, we sell to retailers. We sell to merchants, but I can explain what I, at least what I would expect in both sides. So in our own space itself, um, we're seeing certainly a lot more AI. Um, the probably the best sector, best place for us in terms of, so we sell B2B, right? My businesses are SaaS and we sell to other businesses. The, the place where we're seeing the greatest AI impact is actually marketing and sales. It's a huge amount of, of workflow. So when you sell to B2B, the product life cycle is at least usually 30 days to 90 days. And if you're selling enterprise, it could be a year or two, right? But when we sell to our merchants, it's 30 to 60 days. AI is actually allowing us to cut that down significantly because what used to take a person, the ability to book appointments, send emails back and forth. Oh, I'm trying to find out, do you have this function? Do you have that function? That can all be done with AI today, right? So those are great functions to cut down that sales cycle. There's a lot of other areas like dev and whatnot, but this is probably the easiest and fastest way in which it's making a huge impact with not much investment, really. There's a lot of tools for that now. Um, in the retail space itself, I think there's a lot of areas and opportunities for, for um, AI. So one is obviously inventory management, because in a retail store, your greatest asset besides your people is actually your product. If you're selling physical things, all your money is in your product. So keeping the absolute minimum amount of product without selling out is usually the goal, unless you're selling custom, right? So AI has a huge potential opportunity to number one, make it a lot easier to track how much stock you have, how much you actually need and forecast forward, right? That is probably the biggest cash flow crunch for most retailers today. It's like, okay, how am I gonna be able to anticipate how much I need? I don't wanna sell out, but I don't wanna carry an extra 10 of these because what if I don't sell them? And what if it's seasonal, right? So AI again can have a huge impact on that because it can historically review data better than people. Um, another area I think it can really emphasize is selling through multiple channels. I mean, you're almost expected to be an octopus these days when you're a retailer, you have to sell in every possible medium. You're, I mean, unless they shut down TikTok or something, but you're expected to sell everywhere. On, I have customers that tell us we can't keep up. I mean, we've got Instagram DMs, we've got, you know, X now, we've got Facebook, we've got all these groups and all these places we have to respond to. And then customers walk in the store and say, why didn't you respond to me, right? So part of it is having the ability to mimic customer service to a great extent, or at least make people happy without actually sometimes answering those things is part of the customer service cycle. And I think that's going to happen more and more now. Um, I mean, I think we all have realized as we call companies today more and more of it you're kind of like is this a real person or not i mean most of the time it isn't anymore and i think in retail it's not going to be any different unless you're in the physical store itself and and you mentioned um streamlining ai and cutting down with time yep. something that i've been personally doing was through my forms um, when people come to get some more information, fill out a form, I can now use that form to develop maybe a project proposal or have my meetings more streamlined and more direct to the point when we get into those consultation or discovery calls. That's how I've been using AI. And I'm also curious to know what your client's challenges are when it comes to AI and sales and marketing. Um, I wouldn't say that our customers even know that they have an AI challenge. I think a lot of people are just afraid that they're going to lose their jobs. 
uh, retail these days is very physically based. Um, no matter how much they say e-commerce is going to kill everything, it's not. It's still over 80% of all retail in the U.S. and Canada. Um, it isn't going to change because you're still selling a physical thing, right? Most of the margin that retailers make are actually in the stores, not in online. So I don't think retailers necessarily know they have an AI problem. So if you're, if, if in my opinion, I think if you have a solution to that, uh, I would absolutely say you should communicate. You know, the thing is a lot of people don't really even know that they have a problem. Uh, a lot of people think that every, the way they're running their business, especially somebody who's been running it for 10, 20 years. I mean, people, people are set in their ways, right? they you can't even call it a problem right i mean you could tell them you're actually what are you doing like you could save 20 percent. you wouldn't have this much churn but a lot of people would be like it's been running fine and making money what's your problem right like they get upset when you tell them they have a problem so i think communicating all of that is a great way in which to sell it but i can tell you it might be something where you're even looking at businesses at the next succession generation we do have quite a lot of problems still to this day trying to sell to a certain generation of business owners. So we approach the business owners quite differently. When we're selling to the owner, of if they're in a certain age group or if they're of a certain mindset, we actually change the pitch, right? We have to. The way we sell to the kids of those owners usually is very, very different. So we often will be very cautious to demo separately. We demo to the to the kids usually versus the 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 maybe the the main owners, and then it's almost like if you demo to the kids, usually they will pitch to the owners. They'll make the owners do it, right? So it's kind of like you have to know where you're selling. And when I sell to a business where there's multiple generations, we want to be respectful, of course, of the key owners and make sure we we're satisfying their needs. But we will spin the wheels first with the younger ones because they're the ones that usually will sign up because they're the ones implementing everything, right? So you got to make sure you answer what the, the top owner needs, but you've got to make sure that the implementers actually are on board. Because if you, even if the owner says, I'm doing it, but the managers are a gut, like set against you, you're never going to get your foot in the door, right? So for us, it's been a learning through through every stage and every sector. We just had like a customer today that was like that. It was quite interesting because the father and the son were together in the call and the father is like, He's like insistent that everything was great. And so I was like, that's because you're not doing anything. It was basically the comment during the call. And so you see this often. And this is the type of dynamic that you're kind of trying to get in and then make sure that you're being used, right? Because the part of the problem is if you get in, sell it, and then they stop using you, it's kind of useless too, right? So that's that's where the whole site of life is changing. And AI actually helps from our side. But you know, if you're selling a product in, absolutely make sure you're just pitching it in the right way. I love that you said that. The last thing I want to um, plug in is that I do have an AI service and it's really hard to pitch to brick and mortar shops that have been around. And before this uh, service I had, I try to even do it uh, before COVID, post COVID, because I saw what was happening and I was trying to get people on Instagram in time to kind of scale and expand their presence online because we have 7 million people in the GTA and I'm certain there's not a million people going through these brick and mortar shops because they just don't know about it because they're not online. And so when I go to these places, it's, it's hard to pitch. So I'm happy you said you have to like pitch it a different way. I guess I have to figure that out because I'm a, a millennial, I think I am. So I'm like that transition baby. I, I see the past, I see the future, I'm also in the present. Um, so it's just really communicating the benefit of this. Because when people do see AI and um, marketing and social media and Instagram, they're really like, I don't need that. Like people walk in my store every day. Why Why do I need more? But it's like, yeah, that's half more. the problem. Absolutely. <laughs> just make sure that whenever you're repeating something, and this is something I always say too, from a marketing perspective, don't sell the product. Make sure you're selling the benefit. Because, I mean, I know you've probably heard it before, right? You've got the drill. You're not selling the drill. You're selling the hole. It's exactly the same problem when you're selling to any business owner. Telling them they need this function means nothing to them. Telling them it'll save them 10 hours a month means something to them. Right. Or and, and it'll give them 10% in extra sales, right? So the way you pitch that matters and the way you 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 phrase what you're offering matters. 
So the praise I, I give them is, is um, like, how would you like to increase your local sales, right? Would you like more people coming into your shop? And I guess people are comfortable with what they already have. So they're not looking to expand or invest for their future. So their answer is like, oh, I'm okay with where I'm at. And, and I'm like, but don't you want more? Like, you know, um, <laughs> it's kind of mind boggling to me, which is why I also do mindset work when I work with um, business owners and people who want to expand. But that's the answer I get. So it's just a challenge that I'm looking to overcome um, when it comes to plugging myself into the brick and mortar to who yeah. want to be socially online you you have to find somebody who complacency is actually the worst of all evils when it comes to selling you can only sell somebody with two things one is the promise of growth or or the promise of avoiding fears if somebody is basically yeah i'm pretty good they're not going to move there's just no way you can convince anybody to move or do anything extra so i wouldn't say even if that's the case you should try to screen those people out in your in your screening process or lead generation process to make sure you're not even wasting time uh, on the people that are like that and maybe you it feels like I know stereotyping and generalizing but maybe there is a cohort of people based on certain you know characteristics that you should avoid because they're probably going to be complacent and so therefore this is where you do persona, like, you know, persona work, right? What does your persona look like? Who are the target people who are most likely to want your, your product because they're fearful of going out of business or want your product because they want growth? And then that's kind of where you, you would go from there. And I'm sure, Lena, um, when you talk about the programs, you guys have probably lots of that type of stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Goldie, well, yeah, I sent you a message as well. Uh, let's set up a call and we might be able to help you with that. Uh, perfect. Wow, so many questions for you, Karen. Uh, That's awesome. <laughs> uh, so, Luciana, I hope I pronounced that correctly. Uh, yeah, thanks, Alina. Uh, thank you, Karen. Uh, that was a great session. Uh, I just uh, have a quick question. Uh, my company is more towards, you know, uh, AI, gen AI based startup in fashion industry. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, I want to ask, like, how better or what are the points I need to add in my pitch deck so that, you know, I can present it well uh, to get uh, get to the investors. So, yeah. What are the do's and don'ts I need to add? Well, that's a pretty good question, though. So, Lieutenant, <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, I can give you some points. The, the, I mean, I'm sure the Space Accelerator can give you lots and lots of help with that. Nafis is probably going to reach out to you soon. Um, but I, I think... There's a couple key things that I've learned at least over the years that have worked for me. Uh, number one, obviously, is less is really truly more when it comes to pitching. And when I say less is more is I can't tell you the number of times that I've looked at pitch decks. My first pitch deck was like 30 pages long, jam full of words, no spaces almost, right? Because I had so much, so much to tell and so much to give. The pitch deck has to be a story. And it uh -huh. has to be, it has to be something that you can visually basically leave a memory in the investor. So, sorry, I didn't phrase that really well, but essentially what I'm trying to say is you have uh -huh. to have a story and your pitch has to be presented as a story. But what I usually find the biggest problem is what is actually the problem in defining it. Most people really have an inability to properly express what the problem is. I've had lots of people pitch the products um, to me even, and of course, even I've heard it and I've done it myself and I had the hardest time doing it for the first couple of years. Mm -hmm. What exactly am I solving that yeah. somebody else hasn't solved? So you have to be able to distill that to one slide usually, and be able to answer it in a very, very compelling way. Mm -hmm. I would say that that is probably the most important thing. So when you say you're doing AI, let's say in fashion, like everybody may or may not know what's in that space. I'm assuming if you are pitching to people who are familiar with that space, you mm -hmm. really just need to make sure that you actually have defined what that is very, right. very, very clearly because most people don't know how to define the problem. Most people usually pitch by saying what they've built, mm -hmm. or what the intention is of what they built or what mm -hmm. they want to achieve or how much money they're going to make. Nobody ever really puts probably enough focus on why this is a problem that nobody is solving that only I can solve. And it sounds like, okay, well, obviously, right? Like, but it is so hard to get that into one sentence 
that is right. differentiated and clearly explains what you're targeting. Do you see what I mean? Um, yeah. And I know I'm probably not saying something that you haven't heard already, it, but it, I would emphasize that that's something that many people actually don't usually do well. I I, I have I was mentoring a group actually um, not too long ago, and they had a fantastic product, but they kept talking about and again not to say it's bad. They kept talking about how the product would save the environment, and so telling investors that you're going to save the environment as the problem isn't going to get them to invest in you as an example, right? Uh, because investors are going to be, well, what exact, how are we going to make money here, right? That, I mean, that's why investors invest unless you're working on certain groups. There are places in groups and organizations and government programs that will support social, you know, um, organizations and entities, right? And social causes. But if you are building a product that to in a poor for-profit category and trying to sell it, then you have to be able to answer that, right? And so a lot of people focus on their inspiration, for example, why I was inspired to build it. Well, you inspiring and building doesn't mean there's a market kind of thing, right? So again, being able to, it. by the way, it doesn't mean you have to know that. It, it means that you have to be able to, I'll use the word spin here, but basically you have to be able to phrase what you do in that way. And everything can be phrased in a way that can be sold, by the way. It's never a question of the product. It's actually the question of how you sell it. Oh, that's really great. Thank you, Karen. <laughs> All right. Amazing. So we have two minutes left. So if are there any burning last minute questions for Karen? Oh, there's a lot of questions. I appreciate it. I, <laughs> I wasn't sure whether or not um, this would work, but. It was a great session, Karen, obviously. It was like a reaction. Everybody wanted to ask these questions from you. Uh, <laughs> I love Brian's <laughs> question. <laughs> if I was maybe 10 years younger, Brian, um, I have to tell you, I was telling my husband, I was like, you know what? Maybe we should do like a create another app. He kind of walked out of the room on me recently. <laughs> so he's told me enough is enough. Like, can we at least focus on the dog or something these days? Like we, we're still working and we enjoy what we're doing very much. And so we're happy to see our baby come to fruition. Uh, we were very lucky again to also be acquired by somebody who we actually work along with well. Not every private equity acquisition goes well. Uh, many of them you end up leaving in three to five months because they don't have the same vision. So we, you know, things worked out for us, but again, I would, you know, probably want to do other things, but I, I know that I'm probably not going to be able to convince the rest of my family to come along for another ride this time. I'll be honest, I liked your presentation because you know what, you were hands on, you had grit. And uh, you know what, when you presented your information, you were coming from a point of, I've been there, done it. And here's how you avoid it. So I think I think for me speaking, I can't speak for everyone else, but I think comments would, would justify it is that we've now been able to sort of start here from listening to your experiences as opposed to kind of having to muddle our way through it and make those mistakes. So that's why I found your session like really informative. I thought it was excellent. Thank you, Brian. That's that's always really rewarding to to be able to actually share um and hopefully help everybody here because it's a crazy journey. I admire all of you for do we're doing what you're doing and the environment today isn't easy, right? So the, the fact that you are all doing this and you've you've got your heads down doing it means that you guys all have grit really. And so thank you for for those comments. I really do appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so we're at the 8 p.m. mark. We're going to wrap up the session. Karen, I'm just going to echo what Brian said. Honestly, this was so fantastic and not for all the expertise that you brought in, but also for so authentically and openly sharing your story. I think that is something that spoke to all of us in the room. So thank you so much for that. Really, really appreciate it. I know it's been a crazy week for you. You're super busy. So really appreciate you taking out the time and sharing uh, your journey with us and spending your Tuesday evening with us. Thank you so much, Karen.